This PC was made with one purpose, to sell pizzas. Okay, well maybe not just pizzas, but it was originally a point of sale system at a fast food pizza joint. Today though, I'm going to see what else it can do. With its unique design and hidden features, it might work well as a silent home server, a simple desktop system, or maybe even a hardcore gaming machine. Okay, maybe not that last one, but there's only one way to find out. So like I mentioned earlier, this system came from a viewer of mine who works at a Marco's Pizza restaurant, a very large pizza chain here in the US. I guess the business upgraded their point of sale systems, and so this viewer asked if he could take home the older systems they were planning to get rid of. I won't name anybody just to keep everyone out of trouble, but I'm very appreciative because this quiet little unit is actually pretty cool. But it is a little bit old, and it's not a surprise that they upgraded to something else. And that's a great example of how quickly technology evolves in the business world. For those of you working in large organizations or running your own small businesses, you know just how fast things move and how crucial it is to have great software for your business to keep everything running smoothly. That's why I'd love to briefly talk about the sponsor of today's video, Odoo. Odoo is an open source ERP software suite that includes a set of more than 45 easy to use applications, making it a good choice for even the largest of organizations. But because of its modular platform, even if you run a small business, you can just start with the core features you need and expand as your business grows. Whether you're handling CRM, inventory, accounting, or project management, Odoo's got you covered with a seamless unified system. They even have a website builder to easily let you build and customize your own website. What's great about Odoo is its flexibility and cost effectiveness. You can self-host the Community Edition on-premises for free, and the Enterprise Edition offers great value with additional features and support. Plus, you can start up your first application for free for life. So if you just want to use one application, you can do that entirely for free. There's also a huge community of developers and users out there, so you're never going to be short on resources or advice. So if you're looking for ways to help organize and streamline your organization, or you want to effectively grow your small business, make sure to check out Odoo. If you're interested, I'll have a link down in the description where you can get a free 14-day trial with no credit card needed. This is the Touch Dynamic Saturn DV J1900, a fanless point-of-sale system that originally sold for, well, way more than I would pay for it. It was originally meant for checkout counters or drive throughs and I imagine this one helped to sell a lot of pizzas. But today, I want to see if this can be repurposed. I mean, it does have quite a few things going for it. First of all, it's passively cooled with no moving parts, making it essentially dead silent. There aren't a ton of ports on the outside, at least not ones that are particularly useful in most contexts, but there's actually some potential for expansion on the inside. First, there are two SATA ports. One is accessible with this adapter, and the other is soldered directly to the motherboard. However, with that one, you won't be able to use a standard 2.5-inch SSD. You either need one of those slim SATA flash modules like what you might find on the inside of older Wise Thin clients, or you can often just remove the PCB from inside a 2.5-inch SSD. There's also what appears to be a mini PCIe slot, which we'll dive into here in a bit. The Saturn DV J1900 comes with, as the model name might suggest, an Intel J1900. This decade-old quad-core mobile CPU isn't impressive by today's standards, but I think it still might be capable of some useful tasks even in 2024. Plus, it's a mobile chip, so it doesn't draw a ton of power, and it comes in a passively cool chassis that's really easy to mount on or under something. So I imagine there are a few ways this little pizza slinger could be put to use. To see if it even worked, I hooked up the power supply and a VGA cable. The blue LED lit up, but I wasn't getting anything on screen. After maybe 30 seconds or so though, I did get this awful buzzer. With the system being a bit different from other typical PCs, I wasn't quite sure if I was missing something. I checked the CMOS battery, but I doubted that was the problem. I considered adding some sort of bootable media to see if maybe that was the issue, and I was also a bit nervous that maybe this system wouldn't even post without being connected to some other piece of hardware. But I first decided just to reseat the RAM. Now the viewer that sent this also sent a second stick of RAM and 8GB DDR3L SODIMM. I figured this was just in case I wanted to upgrade to max out the spec of the J1900. I assumed the stick of RAM inside the system was what came with it from Touch Dynamic, but before I reseated it, I noticed it was actually a standard DDR3 module, not DDR3L. I haven't specifically tested out the J1900 before, but I did mess around with a system that featured its cousin, the J2900, and back then I got burned by not realizing it required DDR3L. I'm not sure why this system had the non-low voltage memory in it, but after swapping to the 8GB stick, I got a much more satisfying beep, I got a beep, and then was met with the BIOS. 
After setting the correct date and time, I took a quick look around. Sadly, most of the settings just had to do with point of sale hardware like LCD panels, as well as the multitude of serial ports. But I was able to at least change the boot options to boot from USB. After adding an SSD to one of the SATA connections, plugging in some install media, and getting past this terrifying splash screen, I was able to install Windows 10. And if you haven't watched this channel before, don't worry, I do get to Linux as well. I ran a few quick benchmarks just to get a baseline of what this J1900 could do, starting with Cinebench R23. And oh man, this took forever, finally getting a multi-threaded score of just 497. I didn't even run the single-threaded test because, well, I needed to finish this video at some point. For some context, this newer Intel N100 mini PC I tested a while back was 375% faster. And not to get ahead of myself, but it was 375% faster while only drawing 38% more power. In the older Cinebench R15, the J1900 scored a 122, slightly below an old AMD Athlon dual core from 2009. Later on, I also ran Sysbench in Debian Linux. And here, the Saturn J1900 had very similar scores to a Dell Wise 3040 Thin Client, which has an Intel Atom X5 Z8 350. So clearly, there's not much horsepower here, but sometimes low power draw is actually more important. And when looking at that, things aren't terrible by any means. When sitting idle in Windows, the system drew around 10 watts from the wall, which is okay, but when running Cinebench and pushing the CPU to 100%, the system still only drew around 13 watts. Now, this isn't incredible when compared to modern systems or even that Dell Y system I mentioned earlier, which drew substantially less power. But still, 100 watts isn't going to make a huge impact on your power bill or anything. I also noticed that this enclosure does a really good job of managing thermals. Even when running an extended Cinebench render, things stayed incredibly cool. This was a bit disappointing, honestly. I was kind of hoping for the thermals to be bad, to give me an excuse to crack this thing open and change the thermal paste. But I decided to just crack it open anyway. The teardown was really simple, with just some Phillips screws that were all the exact same size. Once I had the bottom and side panels off and the motherboard screws out, the board popped out with no problems. I was surprised though to see thermal pads instead of thermal paste. This probably makes a lot of sense though, as I imagine the pads will last much longer without needing to be replaced. And clearly, they're working just fine. I did clean up the case a little bit, but it shockingly wasn't that dirty. And because this system doesn't need any fans, the inside of the case was nearly spotless. I did leave the bump one sticker just for a little bit of character though. With everything back together, I decided to focus on that mini PCIe slot. I wasn't sure at first if it was mini PCIe or mSATA, but after finding the specs online, I was able to confirm that it was indeed mini PCIe. And this is huge. Having PCIe means we can really tinker with this thing. The first thought that popped into my head was adding a second NIC, and lo and behold, that's actually one of the reasons the slot exists in the first place. There's a punch out on the side of the case for an optional second network interface that you could purchase the system with. I don't have a mini PCIe network adapter, but I do have a mini PCIe to M.2 E key adapter. And then I also have an M.2 E key to two and a half gigabit NIC. So I installed both of those, knocked out the hole on the side of the case, and then screwed the network port into the chassis. This was a little bit annoying as the hole spacing was slightly off either on the case or my adapter, but I eventually forced it into place. Once back in Windows, I found that the 2.5 gigabit NIC was recognized, so I started up some blazing fast 2.5 gigabit transfers, oh boy. Okay, after installing the correct drivers, I fired up some blazing fast 2.5 gigabit transfers from my NAS, and that worked as expected. But there's a lot more you could do here than just adding network ports. You could add some more SATA ports to add more drives, a Coral TPU for some cool AI stuff, a Wi-Fi adapter, or you could get a little crazy and grab a mini PCIe to PCIe adapter like this one here. For some reason, I was expecting this to fail, but after hooking up a quad 2.5 gigabit NIC, well, it worked. Now, I don't know how well it would work, considering this connection is limited to just one lane of PCIe Gen 2, but it worked. Heck, it even worked with an NVIDIA T1000 GPU. Honestly, outside of making a video for YouTube, I don't see any reason why someone would want to do this, but I did it and even fired up a couple of games. Hollow Knight ran okay with just a couple of little stutters. I expected a simple 2D title to work, but was a bit shocked to see Rocket League running. There were also a few little stutters here, but still very much playable. I imagine it was the CPU causing those hitches in both cases, but I didn't take the time to install something like MSI Afterburner because, well, come on. Obviously, no one is going to be gaming on one of these. At least they shouldn't be. 
But one of the thoughts I had for this was to use it either as a simple desktop system or even a thin client to remotely connect to a virtual machine. I currently have a table out in my garage for my 3D printer, but it's also right next to a lot of my storage for the channel. Sometimes I use that space to piece some things together or move parts around, and at times it could be useful to have a simple PC out there to look up parts or reference scripts and notes. And yes, you might have noticed that is the desk I recently got as an upgrade for my wife, but don't worry, we actually bought her another one from FlexiSpot that she likes a bit more, and so I moved the other one out into the garage. I did not steal it from my wife. Anyway, I was thinking this might actually work for a decent system out in the garage. It could easily mount to the bottom of that desk to stay out of the way, and because of the low power chip and passive design, I wouldn't have to worry about it getting dusty. I don't really know if this is the right fit though. In Windows, performance was okay when just browsing the web. YouTube playback was a bit rough though once you moved beyond 720p, even with the H.264 Fi extension. If I decided to use this as a desktop, my plan wasn't to use Windows though. Instead, I installed Linux Mint, but once it got installed, I had this weird issue where the display was sort of zoomed in or chopped off. Originally, I thought it was just an issue between the VGA output, the HDMI adapter, and my capture card, but I got the same result when just directly connecting the system to a monitor over VGA. Once again, I didn't have this issue with Windows, but I had it with Linux Mint, as well as Debian 12 with GNOME, and even when running the Proxmox installer GUI. So just a quick note on Debian 12 and GNOME, I misread my notes when writing the script, but it did work once I got logged in, although I couldn't select the correct resolution. But logging in was a challenge because that screen was partially cut off, so I had to blindly log in and I wasn't able to change desktop environments. So it sort of worked, but still not great. All right, back to the video. Now I realize all three of those are based around Debian, so maybe I could get around the issue by using a different distro, or maybe there's a fix I could have found, but it still seems like being limited to VGA and not having DisplayPort or HDMI might be a problem. Because of those display issues, I didn't even get around to testing this thing out as a thin client, and between the weird display stuff and the lack of performance, I really just don't think this is going to be a great choice for a simple desktop. But there are still plenty of potential use cases for this thing. In the state it's currently in right now with the dual NICs, this could work as a DIY firewall and router with something like PFSense or OpenSense. There are some downsides to that, however. First, the integrated NIC and the 2.5 gigabit NIC are both Realtek. Both OpenSense and PFSense are based on FreeBSD, which has really bad support for Realtek NICs. Now you can find guides on how to manually install them, which I actually did on my personal PFSense box and haven't had issues. However, a lot of people still advise against using these with PFSense and OpenSense. The J1900 also probably just isn't a good CPU for the job, and might start to limit network performance with a lot of users. It also lacks the AES NI instruction sets, which help with encryption and decryption. You'll probably want that if you're looking to run something like OpenVPN on your router. Now maybe you could use this as a router in like a testing environment or something, but with all of the potential downsides, I just opted not to even test this out as a router. But I did want to see if this box could be useful as a home server or some sort of addition to your home lab. I decided to install Proxmox, but wanted to take advantage of the two SATA ports. So I cracked open this 128GB SSD that was sent over with the system, and hooked it up to the SATA port that's directly on the motherboard. I installed a second 128GB SSD in the little tray that's accessible from the bottom. But because of the height of the mini PCIe adapter and the 2.5GB adapter, the system wouldn't close. So I also took the PCB out of that second SSD, and hooked it up, well, like this. If you were to actually run your system in a similar manner, I would definitely recommend taping things off somehow to prevent any shorts. I installed Proxmox to both SSDs in a ZFS mirror, and set things up like I normally would. I started off by setting up a Home Assistant VM using one of the incredibly helpful TTEC scripts, and after a few minutes, it was up and running with no issues. I could see this box working really well for someone just looking to set up Home Assistant, as it has enough CPU horsepower for most things and could easily be tucked away or mounted somewhere, never to be seen or heard. I also set up a Debian LXC container, and then installed Casa OS and spun up containers for both Crafty Controller and Jellyfin. In Crafty Controller, I set up a vanilla Minecraft server which did take quite a while to start up. I was able to join the server with no issues, but yeah, the J1900 just isn't cut out for this. Terrain generation was quite the chore for this little guy, and I can't imagine what having multiple players on the server might do. In Jellyfin, I had no issues with direct streaming, but while the J1900 does technically support QuickSync, I don't think the older version is still supported, and even if it was, I don't know how useful it would really be. 
So while this probably isn't a good choice for streaming media or anything that's demanding on the CPU like running a game server, it could still work just fine for some basic self-hosted tasks like Home Assistant or Pi-hole, or maybe even for monitoring other devices in your home lab. Also, I sort of briefly mentioned that this thing has a lot of these COM ports, which I imagine are for connecting to a variety of point of sale devices using a UART connection or whatever. But I'm kind of curious what else this could be used for. If you're the kind of person that really likes to mess with or design hardware and find yourself in need of a lot of serial connections, maybe this could be a useful controller of sorts. And I'd love to hear if you guys have any fun ideas of what you maybe could do with some of these serial ports. So now we've seen some of what this little system can do. It has limited CPU performance, but is passively cooled and has some decent room for expansion. But is it a good value? Well, the answer is probably either absolutely or absolutely not. That's because odds are you're either going to just stumble upon one of these being thrown out, in which case, well, it's hard to beat free, or you're going to spend way more than you should when there are tons of other options with similar or even better features and performance. Maybe these are still useful in the business world and that's why used prices are still pretty high. I don't really know. But really, I just found this system to be interesting and wanted to make a fun video on it that I hope you enjoyed. If you did, I'd love if you could hit that like button and maybe even subscribe to see more. And if you want to help support the channel, you can become a raid member for as little as a dollar a month, where you get early access to videos as well as some behind the scenes stuff and other cool perks. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.